right, welcome everybody to the Skaldic Archive. Uh, really excited about this. Most of you know me, but this is my good friend now, uh, Garrett, and he's going to be helping me out with this. Um, he has a podcast that he's called The Bard's Archive. Um, he's had some very cool guests on already, and we're kind of teaming up. The Bards are kind of like the equivalent of the Skulls from the Norse into the Celtic tradition. So we're kind of blending these podcasts and making it into one and uh, bringing on some very, very interesting guests. And uh, yeah, first uh, first episode is going to be very exciting. What, uh, what did you have in mind for the first show, Garrett? All right, Thor. Uh, I was thinking we could talk about the Skulls in particular and Skaldic. And not just with that, but also poetry in Norse culture and history and its importance it's it's a very it's very cool that we start uh, the first episode with with this subject because skald is kind of it's a lot more um in depth and a, they had a lot more functions than people think um the main function of the skalds was for storytelling and this is what we see in the skaldic poetry this is what we see uh, uh from what most people know about skalds in the history books they told stories of the kings they told stories of battles and they did it in some kind of poetic form various different poetic forms um they were also uh this is kind of getting into the things that people don't know about them they were kind of spiritual experts too and they were keepers of the language and the hidden meanings the poetical metaphors and all these things because of that they were the ones who understood the true meanings of the myths most of the most reliable sources we have of our mythology and the gods and, and all things like that those were written we don't know exactly who they were written by, but it certainly seems like they were written by skulls, but definitely the poetical metaphors were uh, were something to be understood by skulls and, and skulls alone pretty much. And everyone else would have a very difficult time uh, understanding it if they didn't have uh, the skulls help. Thing that I, I don't know, I would like to ask you um, about bards um, uh, uh, and how that developed, but one thing that is, is probably the biggest misunderstanding of the skulls as the actual people that were alive in the viking age that were composing these poems uh, they were not wimps <laughs> they were some <laughs> yeah. of the toughest warriors sometimes <laughs> they were some of the most beastly brutal guys some of them uh, very unpolitically correct and vulgar <laughs> And um, yeah, they, they were not wimps like we think of like poets from the Renaissance era or, yeah. you know, just kind of uh, someone hired by the king to be entertaining. The skulls were like uh, very, uh, po poetry was a very masculine thing back then. Uh, so they were respected in, in all ways. Yeah. Well, in the medieval era, it's actually more of uh, jesters and paid fools that were hired by the king for entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. The bards initially uh, originated from the Druids in ancient Ireland or ancient UK. A lot of people like to particularly say it was in Ireland with the Celts and the Gaels, their predecessors. So the bards, uh, their job was to preserve information uh, primarily from, as they start, their conception, it was the Druids or the Tardrua that wanted to share whatever knowledge from one generation to the next, the bards were the ones that had to convey that. Yeah, I, I feel like every culture, uh, personally from my studies, uh, roughly has the same thing. In the ancient times, you'd have had somebody, eventually some group like the bards, there's always some kind of spiritual leader or a group of human libraries was there any documentation that they had people trying to preserve uh, any of those? Like, do we know what's the oldest uh, records or potential record of uh, any sort of scalds or people trying to record history in some way? Yeah, the, uh, the, the earliest mentions we have of scalds um, that were actually called by the name skull is the early viking age so the early 800s and they're actually the oldest texts we have written from the viking age um uh, or at least the oldest uh, written evidence maybe the texts were recorded a couple hundred years later but we can tell from the people involved in it and the 
poetical language and things like that, that that the skaldic poems are actually the oldest that we have. But this, is, I mean, there's no telling how old it is. There's uh, ancient Roman sources telling about the exact same thing. They don't call them by name, but they tell them how the Germanic tribes they had elders that would sing these ancient, ancient songs, and they were the keepers of these songs. Um, Tacitus Germania is, is the most famous source, but there are other ones like that uh, from around the same time. So that's at, at least 700 years before the Viking Age. Um, so who knows how far they go back. So I'm uh, particularly interested in um, your theories on why uh, people would have had scalds. Mm. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's, it's like you said, it's um, life was difficult and people, they didn't write things down. Okay, maybe they did have some written in inscriptions, but not as uh, not something that you could carve down on a little piece of wood and pass <laughs> down through the generations. I mean, these stories were these stories are so incredibly long, and you know we think of all, all of these texts and all of these poems, even the shortest ones that we know of today. We're thinking, oh, I can't remember that. What, what? How do you do this? But then this is this was the skull's job. I don't know about the bard too, but it sounds like it. It was. It was the job of these people to remember these ancient poems, these ancient stories, and thousands of them. It's, and it's really, that takes a full-time job, but it's a very, very important job too. And yeah, we, we kind of think today, like, how would they ever do that? How is this possible? But the same kind of thing still exists today. If you uh, go to some tribal communities, um, the people that still have these poetic oral traditions, they'll be singing the song by memory for for 10 minutes or even longer so it's uh it's not impossible um it was done and that was their job basically but it was a full-time job yeah it's a thing um one prime demonstration i think it's the best one we have so far is native american culture because if you ever go to like over this weekend i just went to a powwow and uh, you can see in all of their songs, um, there's some kind of action or in all of the dances, there's always something that they're teaching um, from one, one generation to the next. Uh, there's a particular kind of song where uh, they're teaching people to duck in war uh, from the arrows that are flying at their heads. Oh. Um, and there's another one uh, one woman told me when she used to do uh, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, she used to teach uh, her scouts uh, the scouting dances or the scouting dance. I can't remember if it's one or multiple. And uh, <laughs> and all, all for memory, right? The songs and the dances. All, all they, of they it. Still do for all memory. of it's from the top, right, right at the top of their head. Yeah. So do you know why also... Um, quickly just to backtrack half a step why there would have been loose meanings or why there would have been a lot of uh, cryptic messages or uh, very subtle no idea it's just something they like to do maybe <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can give you a couple of examples here i took some notes um yeah uh, there's kennings and haiti right um uh, kennings they're 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 called genitive phrases as as uh, linguists will call them right um and they're basically a phrase that is referring to something else so you can say uh the horse of the waves right and um, what is a horse to a wave uh, that's a ship so that means a ship so a, the poem would be going blah 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 the waves horse and that means the ship um, and only some people would understand what that is uh, then we have haiti, uh, which is basically synonyms, but it's usually only one word or a or a quick phrase, and and those usually refer to uh, some elements of the mythology or or the gods or something like that. Like jaknis, uh, shaking ground means the sea. Thvinis uh, dir, like thvinis beast, uh, that meant uh, shipo. Uh, also, so it's. Um, yeah those kinds of things just so people can get a rough idea of what these hidden meanings were did they just kind of 
make these things just to be pompous and, and like arrogant so people couldn't understand who knows <laughs> maybe there was a spiritual meaning to it i don't know but i can say that it's it's not something unique to the norse world um especially these tribal peoples who kind of uh, are believed to be taken over by a god be possessed by a god in some kind of ritual or frenzy they they very often when they get up to that ecstatic state they are they're speaking in riddles almost like they're not there like uh, like like it's something else took over them something spiritual took over them and making that not you know easy for everyone to understand 